Wow, thank you. Great room, good crowd, thank you very much. You all fell for the uh, put hack in the title twice gambit and get everyone in the room, so that's good. Uh, thanks for the introduction, thanks for the opportunity to be here. My name is Kevin Dunn. Um, I'm a technical VP for NCC Group, based out of Austin, Texas. Um, I've been an attack and penetration focused uh, consultant for about 15 years. Uh, spent a lot of time breaking into systems and into companies and all different kinds of uh, technology stacks and all different types of uh, industry verticals. Um, I do live in Austin. Uh, that's not my mugshot though, it's my visa picture. I'm originally from the UK. Uh, Austin's amazing. This 50 or so pounds of barbecue weight that I'm sporting is testament to that. It's a pretty amazing place. If you ever get a chance to go there, you should. Um, I look after a couple of uh, practices at NCC Group. Um, one is called Strategic Infrastructure Security, and another is the Incident Response Team. So I get to look at both sides of the coin, really. Um, I get to look at how we break into companies and then how we defend companies and how we stop live attacks from happening, all that good stuff. Um, if I was to say I had a specialist specialism, it would definitely be in red team pen testing, in kind of like aggressive attacker model pen testing. And a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk to you guys about today is based on what I see in the wild um, while I'm doing pen tests. Uh, and some of the stuff actually came from as recently as this week, so it's pretty fresh. Okay, so what do I want to, to do with you today? Well, I'll do a little bit more on uh, intro, let you guys know a little bit more about me and the company I work for. Uh, I'll talk about, though, the major types of cloud services uh, and the most common services in the cloud that we encounter. Uh, and this, you know, that little asterisk is to remind me to say that it's based off what I see, right, as a pen tester. So there will obviously be tons of others, but these are what I see most often. Uh, we'll have a, a, a quick chat about uh, the benefits of cloud versus on-premises deployments. Uh, a lot of you in the room will be working for companies that are embracing cloud technology. Uh, uh, for a variety of different reasons, uh, and we'll jump into just a few ways in which you may do it or you may be planning on doing it. Um, the main meat of what I'm going to talk about, though, is obviously to do with security. Um, I'm going to talk about the concerns around cloud security. Uh, I'm going to look at some pen test case studies, some examples of what I, what I see and, and what we use to exploit firms. It's all going to be pretty basic stuff, though, and when we look at the lessons learned, Hopefully, most of you will be able to sing along with me at the end when it comes to what needs to happen, but what is not currently happening in, in the majority of firms. So, let's make a start. Um, NCC Group, right, I work for a company called NCC Group. We're a global security firm. Um, and what's great about working there is that we get to see so much. Uh, we get to look at lots and lots of companies, all trying to solve either very similar challenges or, you know, in some cases, completely different and diverse. Uh, we look at this thing called total information assurance. We want to be able to offer advice on pretty much everything that your company does. So whether it's around application security, or whether it's around securing the company, around DevOps, whatever it might be, um, or whether it's around modeling you know, the ways in which you may get hacked and you may get compromised, and showing how that um, actually relates to things like theft of source code or theft of IP or whatever, whatever your um, biggest fears are, um, that's really a key area for us and, and for me. Um, I'm based out of Austin, but we have offices all around uh, the US. Um, and if you don't know our company name, you may know um, some of the firms that we integrated into NCC Group. Uh, NGS Software, Intrepidus Group, ISEC Partners, and Matasano were all of the brands that are now, now fall under NCC Group. Um, it's often quicker to name what we don't do than what we do do, right? But ultimately, in a, in a nutshell, uh, you know, we, we look at lots of things. Uh, <laughs> we look at lots of attacking, uh, and then also we look at in incident response. So whether it's attacking applications, or users, or buildings, or networks, it doesn't matter, um, because I certainly believe that it's really about all of that. Your company is about all of that. And focusing in on only one thing um, is often a little bit blinkered, and it means that things will get missed. So anyway, on with the show. So let's talk about the cloud. You guys have probably uh, seen these types of memes and what have you, right? It's not the cloud, it's just other people's computers. Um, when you think about security in the cloud, this is something you really have to keep in your mind. Um, it sounds obvious, but uh, it really is like the main bearing of why security in the cloud can be difficult. Um, how much control do you have over the data, over the systems, over, over all aspects? So, Let's talk about, though, general deployment models that we see, because the way in which you and your company use the cloud can be pretty diverse. 
So uh, when, we look, when we talk to companies and we look at what they do, um, there are a number of ways in which they may use the cloud. Firstly, uh, we use cloud services to support a product and our customers. Quite a lot of the people in this room, I assume, have that kind of model. You use a cloud service platform in order to support your product and your customers. We use cloud services to support aspects of enterprise IT and our user base. This is where you've decided as a firm to offset parts of your traditional IT into cloud service providers. A great example of this would be uh, Office 365, right? Put your Exchange servers in the cloud, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we build uh, cloud service platforms. Well, okay, that's probably speaking to a much smaller part of the room, but certainly we do work with companies that actually build the cloud service plat platforms that you use as consumers. Or we do something really new that you've not heard of yet. Well, that's the beauty of consultancy, right? This happens all the time. Uh, ultimately, you end up talking to customers and they, and they tell you about something that um, really you didn't know was happening. Uh, this is happening more on the virtualization space for me. Things like micro perimeters and what have you, and SDN is, is really, really big and really interesting. And that's why I love being a consultant. You get to learn about all the new stuff and see how people are implementing them. So let's think about this. Um, shamelessly stolen diagram from Wikipedia number one, right? Uh, how many people's company still looks like this, the traditional DMZ? Yep, some people do raise their hands, right, because I recognize that for a lot of firms, this is actually what they've been working on for the past 20 years, creating a robust outer edge, a perimeter, a DMZ, such that you can provide services externally while still protecting your company. And things like, you know, the outer edge firewall and the inner edge firewall, very classic design, very important. Um, but for a lot of companies, especially the ones that are embracing cloud technology and cloud uh, service platforms, it's not this, this simple anymore, right? It becomes very complicated because they've offset things outside of the enterprise. So the perimeter, the, the, the crunchy outer shell, is, is not that anymore. It's, it's jagged and it's, it relies on third parties and all sorts of interesting things. So. Um, probably everybody here knows all the different types of cloud services, but I wanted to start here and just kind of set the baseline and talk about the different cloud service types that you're probably familiar with or maybe you're learning about. Um, the first is obviously uh, this thing, software as a service, uh, SaaS. It's been around for a long time as a term. Um, but ultimately what we're talking about here is uh, software as a service is a software licensing and delivery model where you don't have the software and the licenses on your desktop, you have it and you pull it out of the cloud. Great examples of this, right, at the bottom there, salesforce.com. In fact, their logo is all about no software, right? It's trying to tell you something. Um, Workday, Concur, Citrix GoToMeeting, Google Apps, WebEx, all those types of things. This is you using a software platform that's not on your premises, it's elsewhere. So software as a service, probably the, the one that most people use most readily. For developers, we're probably talking about the next category, right? We're talking about platform as a service, paths. Platform as a service is a category of cloud computing service that provides a platform allowing customers to develop, run, and manage web applications or other kinds of web application. So this is where the force.coms and the Heroku's and the Google app engine and maybe Apache Stratos, those types of things come into play. Um, who in the room is using platform as a service for development? Yep, great, excellent. So this is a great example of you putting something that's critical to your IP into the cloud, into the hands of a third party. Okay, and then the last one, the big one, right? Infrastructure as a service. We're probably all pretty much familiar with this. This is where we are actually building parts of our infrastructure in the cloud. This is the Amazon AWS's, the Windows Azure's, and other, you know, cloud environments that, you know, I definitely see less often than the first two, but certainly things like Rack Open Space, IBM Smart Cloud, uh, Dell Open Cloud is another one. Um, people are making use of this in order to build parts of their infrastructure. I'm pretty sure most people in the room will be familiar with this concept and are using AWS or Azure or what have you. Um, one thing that I did want to mention though, in addition to these traditional kind of cloud services, um, is an honorable mention to Citrix. It's not a cloud service at all, um, but the way in which we hack it is often really similar to the way in which we hack cloud services. Um, so I'll definitely mention some of this because um, the reason I do this is because there are often some really smug people in the audience that have not made any kind of move towards the cloud yet. So they think they're pretty immune to everything I'm going to talk about. And then when I say, but you have Citrix, they kind of bow their head and nod. And, uh, and I'll show them that it's pretty much the same problem. It's just something that's hosted on-premises instead of in the cloud. 
So we'll take a look at that. Obviously, um, if you're not familiar with Citrix, it allows you to have a published application or a full desktop in a, in a virtualized environment. Um, and you know, a lot of companies use it, right? So um, all of that said, the most common cloud services, let's talk about what I see all the time on pen tests. And they're probably not going to surprise you, right? They're probably the types of things that you guys are using. Um, so off, Office 365 pretty much wraps up all of the Exchange and Link and Outlook and OneDrive all into a nice, neat package. Um, who uses Office 365 at their company? Right? Yeah, that's what I'd expect to see, especially where we are in the world, right? A lot of people embracing this. Um, and then, you know, we definitely see things like uh, SharePoint. Um, you know, you can have SharePoint in the cloud now. That was traditionally on your internal network. It can now be hosted by Microsoft on your behalf. Uh, and then, you know, the file transfer stuff, Dropbox and Box and what have you, um, those, those are definitely up there. People are not having conventional file servers so much in their enterprise. Instead, they're having um, cloud providers give them storage. Um, and then on the, 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 the chat side, you know, things like Slack and HipChat and a few others, those are coming out for collaboration. Um, people on the same team needing to collaborate. Um, these are the types of services that we see. Um, so as I said, huge caveat on this. This is based on what I see on security assessments and pen tests. There are obviously lots more. OK, so when we think about why people look at using the cloud versus on-premises deployments, there are like, lots of reasons. If you Google for you know, top 10 reasons for using the cloud or what have you, you'll find that 10 is a small number because there are a list of 25 and more that tell you, you know, reasons why you, you as a company may want to adopt cloud technology. Um, what I did here is there was a much bigger list that I got from Vario.com uh, and, and really what I re recognize is that most of it was talking about the same thing, money and cost. So this is a variety of ways in which you can probably reduce cost in your organization by using cloud service technology. Economies of scale, increased volume, output, or productivity with fewer people. Obviously hugely debatable, but I'm sure that there are plenty of case studies that support that. Reduced spending on technology infrastructure, though, I can definitely get behind that one, right? If you're offsetting your stuff into the cloud, you probably don't have to have that exchange server farm or those file servers, all that kind of stuff. Um, the third point is about licensing fees, right? So if you're using software as a service, typically, uh, the cost associated with the per seat licenses of products that are in the cloud are different and different models to how you would spend traditionally for desktop and server software. So perhaps that definitely works. Globalize your workforce on the cheap. Um, well, maybe, yeah, because the whole point of, of the cloud is it's accessible from anywhere, anyone with an internet connection, which is pretty much everybody in most countries. So um, yeah, this could be a good way. And you don't have to funnel things through corporate VPN endpoints and all that, that terrible, terrible stuff. <laughs> Um, improve accessibility, uh, access anytime, anywhere. Now the thing is, when this is shown as a positive, security people clap their hands together in glee, right? Because that's also the thing that we, we look for. If it's now more accessible, it means it's possibly more accessible to attackers. And that's really the point of my talk and all of my experiences around cloud services. It's about how easy can I get access to your data when it's in the cloud versus when it's not in the cloud, when it's on premises. Less training needed. Um, well, we definitely see this as well. Uh, because everything's driven by a web browser and pretty much everyone in your you know, workforce knows how to use a web browser, it's a lot easier in many regards. You don't have to send your staff on training courses for pieces of desktop software that they need to do their job if it's something that's just accessed via a web browser in the cloud. We could probably think of lots more. Um, but everything that I've read, everything that I've researched, everything I've talked to people about, it's mostly been about cost savings. It doesn't matter which direction you look in, it's about how can I spend less money on IT and IT staff and all that good stuff. OK, so security concerns when it comes to looking at cloud uh, service platforms or using the cloud for parts of your business. I've broken it down into four areas, four distinct areas that I see. And I'll go into detail on, on each of these. Um, ultimately, though, we want to be concerned with uh, the platform itself, how secure is the platform, we want to be concerned with the data. How secure is your data while it's on somebody else's computer, effectively? Um, how much are you able to conduct meaningful incident response when your data is in the cloud? And this varies greatly depending on who you consume and how you use it. Um, and then how is the cloud and the infrastructure you've stood up in the cloud exposing other parts of your business in non-traditional ways, either via traversal or because of simply where you've put it? So let's dive into a few of these. 
The service platform itself, you may think, that's none of my business. It's outside of my uh, responsibility. Um, or you may think, yeah, I'm actually quite interested in that. How well of, have Microsoft and Google and AWS and what have you, how, long, how well have they secured the actual pro, uh, platform itself? Um, what could go wrong with that environment and how could I be affected by it? The devil's always in the detail. Certainly, those companies engage firms to look at the security of their platform proactively. That's excellent. It's great news. Um, but there are kind of interesting little edge cases, certainly to do with multi-tenancy. Um, which tier have you paid for? It, are your servers stood up in an environment that's functionally the same environment as other people's servers? Or do you have, do you have a genuine kind of virtual private cloud, for example? Um, those things could be important. Um, the other thing is that vulnerabilities can come from a few different areas when it comes to the platform itself. It can either come from the um, software-defined networking part, like how they've segmented the multi-tenanted environment and how they've created their network security, or, in my experience, much more likely, it comes from the thing that controls all of that. So when, you, when we're talking really about infrastructure as a service here, but when you spin up machines and you build things, what's the way in which you do that? It's through a web app, right? Or through an API. That's the bit that usually has the bug. And I've certainly reviewed products for people that make systems like this, and the, the vulnerability was in the web application that meant I could um, take down servers that were in other tenant enclaves that weren't mine, for example. Huge problem. But at the crux of it, a web application problem. Should obviously speak volumes to everybody at OWASP. So the platform itself could be something that lets you guys down, for sure. Um, the way in which your administrators and your users authenticate to the platform is also pretty key. Let's talk about this one, though. Data security. At the moment, quite a lot of people seem pretty content with throwing their uh, enterprise data up into the cloud. Um, if you think about uh, Exchange 365, Office 365, fantastic. Great accessibility, you know, cost savings. But what are you doing? You're putting your enterprise company email in the cloud. Now, I mean, your risk management and your risk uh, criteria or, or how you do a risk analysis to this may just stop at the point where you say, it's OK. I completely trust the cloud service provider with that data to handle it sensitively, protect it from attack, so on and so forth. Oh, and also not look at it and mark it to me based on it and all those nefarious things that could happen. If that's where your um, rationale begins and ends, that's fine. I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. What I am going to say is that there are lots of companies that don't believe in that, that worry about the security of their data when it's in the cloud, whether it be drop, you know, because they're using Dropbox or Box or some other file share, or because of their email. So it's an interesting problem. Uh, certainly, we've seen some products kind of spring to life around this concept. Um, I'm, as a firm, we're product agnostic. We don't push anything. But in the interest of saying the things that I've personally looked at, there are a couple of products like Cypher Cloud and Voltive that look at um, how you can encrypt data in the cloud in a way that it's still usable by the CSP but that not, it's, it's not visible. This idea of searchable encryption. Uh, and they have a variety of ways of doing it, but the way you typically do it is you have a gateway product on premises, which is where the keys stay. The keys never go to the cloud service provider. Um, but the data is encrypted before it's sent up and when it comes back down. Um, and it's packaged in such a way that it still is an email and they can still use it and process it and search through it and deliver it. But the actual body of it is, is encrypted with keys that you hold on your premises. Um, this is pretty interesting. It certainly goes a long way to talking about protecting the data as it's in the cloud. The CSP and anyone hacking the CSP should only get the ciphertext. They'd also have to hack you to get the keys off the box to then decrypt it. Um, so you guys have probably seen uh, technologies like this. They're definitely becoming more popular and they're, they're cropping up because it answers this question of how do I secure my data, my enterprise data, when it's in the cloud and being handled by somebody that's not me. Incident response in the cloud. Um, as I said at the beginning, this is an area for me to, uh, of focus. I run the IR practice. Um, and it's kind of interesting. Um, incidents, obviously, and events happen all the time. Um, the CSP that you're using, whether it's you know, in a full-blown infrastructure as a service perspective or some other perspective, I mean, how, um, how good are they at working with you with an in an, on an incident response uh, engagement? And it definitely varies in my experience. But some of the questions you need to be asking yourselves are around, can I get hold of the logs? What do they log? How often is the logging overwritten? All of that kind of thing. 
Um, can I get access to, like, what's the lead time on getting those logs? Um, can I get access to running memory snapshots? Can I get access to the actual images um, for the servers themselves so that I can have somebody provide, uh, perform forensic analysis on them? Um, the case, or the answers to those points really do run the whole range. Sometimes absolutely is the answer and to a very good acceptable level, and other times it's not that. So you do have to think about that. Also, do you have any visibility at all of what's happening up there? Do you have any kind of real-time telemetry from a traffic perspective or any other kind of logging? Um, because a lot of firms obviously build their own um, security operation centers, their own SOCs. So how, how do they get visibility of what's happening up there? These are all really important considerations, I would suggest, for when you put your enterprise data or your customer data in the cloud. Okay. So what about this idea, the last, last area? How do your users access the cloud data? How do your administrators, probably more importantly, access it? What form of authentication are you using? Uh, you know, are we talking about web application consoles? Are we talking about APIs? Are you using keys? Are you using multi-factor authentication? What are you doing? Very, very important. Because the point is, and when I design pen tests that are attacker modeled, the point is, what can happen if an attacker gains access to this system as a user? And then conversely, what can happen if they gain access as an administrator? These are things that we prove all the time through pen tests, and I'm gonna go into examples of this in just a second. The other important, interesting thing is interconnectivity. If those servers in the cloud get compromised in some way, what, where does that get the attacker? Are they kept in the cloud environment, or are there traversal inroads into your real enterprise? And I've certainly worked on pen tests where the second was true. Compromising servers in the cloud meant that I could traverse into the real company on-premises environment. Obviously a huge problem. I'll jump into all of these when we look at um, these case studies. So this is what I wanted to go through. Um, I wanted to look at accessing SharePoint, accessing cloud storage, uh, enterprise email. Uh, we want to look at the, the cloud data centers themselves, how we can compromise or how we have compromised those. Um, and I want to look at sneaking in via domain trust, the last point really that I just mentioned, which is if I compromise something in the cloud, where do I go? How do, can I get further into the company? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And then just for the nostalgic pen testers and the smug people, we'll look at a quick old-fashioned Citrix uh, hack, which is pretty much essentially the same type of hack. But first, okay. Um, so ultimately, I've spent my career doing penetration testing um, and lots of ancillary things associated with that. But what may surprise you is that the things that almost always work when we do an attacker model test, when we try and do a really aggressive pen test, are the things I've got up here, really basic things that worked 20 years ago. We ultimately <coughs> use these, these approaches. We use password guessing, believe it or not. We use targeted spear phishing. People are, will still fall for phishing emails and they will do your bidding based upon it. And we use social engineering. Yes, we call people. Anyone that's expecting um, really detailed, advanced penetration testing techniques from me during this subject, are gonna be disappointed because it's very, very simple. Why do we do it? Because it works almost all the time and it really doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a small organization or a large one. These techniques still work and they still allow me to get the things that I need to then access systems. And predominantly, obviously, we're talking about systems in the cloud at this point. Single password guesses. Um, the amount of time I can find an account that has the password welcome one or password one or summer 2015 right now is amazing. I mean, it, it's, this is what worked 20 years ago, it's what works now. Um, and also, you know, single password guesses we're talking about. We're not gonna lock out any accounts by just trying one of these. So if it's as simple as this, then really all I need is a user list, and then I can do this, right? I can do this against a live cloud app, I can do it on the internal network, whatever it might be. How do I get my user list? OS in. Right? Open source uh, information gathering techniques, effectively. I use LinkedIn to find out who works at the, works at the company. I use uh, document properties for, uh, to find out what their you know, username looks like, and then I build a list based off of that. And then I just run a single password guess. And all I really need is one, right? Hopefully I find somebody that's pretty privileged, um, but usually with this kind of thing, we're probably talking about like, not often IT or security staff, although we have hacked IT and security staff in exactly this way. 
Spear phishing. So everyone thinks they know about spear phishing, and that's great, because um, everyone needs to know about it. Um, but when we do spear phishing as part of a red team or a pen test, we make it a little bit more aggressive. Um, it's all payload based, right? It's all based on, uh, I don't, I'm not doing an engagement where I'm just gathering statistics and saying, oh yes, you know, 94% of your workforce clicked on the link and then was shown a video on why they shouldn't have clicked on the link. No. When they fall for the phishing attack, they get compromised. And compromised is either they gave us their credentials through a, a credential harvesting attack, or it's proper C2. It's I have full control over their workstation right now because they ran the macro attached spreadsheet that I sent them, that kind of thing. And it is that simple. This is an example of one that we use all the time. Um, ultimately, it pretends to come from the IT team. Uh, and we use uh, typo finding to then purchase domains that look exactly like your domains, but like the, um, an L is a one or something like that. Whatever's available. We'll purchase that domain and then we'll send emails from those sender addresses. People fall for it. The, the reason this one works so well is because it's an, about an upgrade. Everyone wants an upgrade. <laughs> and it basically says, you know, if you fill in the attached spreadsheet with your asset tag and all that kind of thing, you may be eligible for an upgrade. People sure as anything do that because what do we, what do we know about corporate environments? The laptop they're forced to use is usually busted and they want a new one. So this works. Um, what about the attachment? Well, it, this is the attachment I use all the time. Uh, it's an Excel spreadsheet. And it's disgusting and gaudy and, and horrible colors because this is what IT departments do of Excel when they make a spreadsheet, in my experience. So uh, we went for a little bit of profiling there. Um, but ultimately, you know, Microsoft have recognized that macros are bad, so they don't run by default anymore. But this spreadsheet says, in order to get the asset tag to automatically populate, enable the macro content. And that's what people do. Because it's a lot easier than having to turn their laptop over and read the asset tag off and put it back, you know. Um, so our software, uh, it does, it's quite helpful. It does take the asset tag and populate it into the spreadsheet. And people send us the spreadsheets back and say, when can I have my upgrade? That's how you know it really worked. But what does it also do? It fully compromises their machine, right? We built an entire platform around doing this. This is what it looks like. These are all the machines that are currently under my control because they ran that, that uh, macro in the spreadsheet. Um, and it doesn't matter. You see, we've got some Apple, we've got some Windows. Um, we, can, we can work with both. So this is excellent, because now I have full control of their machine. I can do things as them. I can dump their credentials. All of this is really around me getting um, you know, their username and password so that I can access things in the cloud as them. Um, the last area is social engineering. Yeah, it does, it does still work. Um, obviously, is this water? Yes, it is water. Obviously, people think that it doesn't. But we have some very, very good, very highly skilled social engineering practitioners in our firm. The, and you think it's a matter of, oh, you'll just be called out of the blue. We will work on campaigns building the relationship for multiple days, multiple weeks, to the point where you genuinely think that we are supporting you in something, and then we get ask you to give us something. Um, so we try to make it as, as, as attacker model as we can based on what your threat actors are. OK, so all of that aside, that's the precursor. How do we do it? Very, very basic stuff. What do we do? Well, let's take a look. Firstly, um, lots of people are using uh, Office 365, as we, as we already saw. Um, did you know it's quite easy for me to find out which companies use it? The Microsoft login portal lets me do it, right? If I just put in uh, foo at whatever company domain I'm looking at and hit tab, um, if they use Office 365, it will take me to their login page, OK? If they don't, it will say I can't find their login page. This is excellent information disclosure from an attacker's perspective. Um, picking on Coca-Cola for no reason, just at random, right? If we did this with the people in here that have a company that work and use Exchange 365, the same thing would work. I would be able to term, determine if I can find you or not. The same thing's true with uh, Google Apps for business. So if Google are the people running your email, I can do the same trick. It will disclose to me who uh, is using it and who isn't based on domains. So pretty, pretty simple. Um, the other thing that's easy to find based just on Google searches is who's got their SharePoint in the cloud, right? This is an example of one um, just at random. But you can see at the bottom, well, maybe you can't see it, but it says this is SharePoint. It actually says it. So now I can do like really simple Google Docs, right, where I just build queries and just look for pages that have SharePoint on them and have a similar kind of URL path, and I can work out who's got their SharePoint in the cloud. 
Same is, is definitely true of uh, cloud storage, right? Dropbox or, or Box or whoever you're using. It's pretty easy for me to figure that out, either through social engineering or just attempting to log in and what have you. Um, but what we're talking about here is just a you know, single factor web page, just enter your credentials. So when we actually pull it off, right? When we actually get a, a set of credentials for a user, what do we now have? Well, everything, right? If you're using Exchange 365, this is taken from a pen test. Um, I've logged in as the user, and sure enough, what do I see? Everything. I have their inbox. I have OneDrive, if OneDrive is being used. I can use Link as them. I can use Instant Messenger. So what we like to do when we're, if depending on the engagement scope, we can ultimately just start sending emails as them now. A nice technique is just to go through the inbox and find out if they regularly exchange Excel spreadsheets with people and then just trojan them and then send them out new copies of the spreadsheet and now I get even more shells. This was all possible because for some reason I was able to get hold of their username and password and then use that to log into Exchange 365, Office 365. What's kind of interesting though is that you can do a lot more with Exchange 365 or Enterprise Email if you have the right level of permission. Um, for example, uh, if you can get hold of the credentials for the enterprise for the exchange admin Now you have the ability to do crazy stuff in the cloud or against exchange 365 um, This is me um, using an open or using a SharePoint portal that was online that we got into with these creds to figure out Which person has mailbox permissions and we just gelled all of this together uh, Microsoft obviously makes it pretty easy for you to understand how to do exchange administration against the cloud instance so it won't probably surprise you, PowerShell, right? It's easy if you've got the right permissions to be able to add yourself a mailbox permission on a different mailbox. So that's exactly what we did. Um, this is me running it, and then ultimately, I'm able to then get to that mailbox and send and receive email as that user. The most important thing to take away from this is that this is definitely what we could achieve with regular old exchange hacking in the enterprise, but where did I do this from? I did this from my hotel room. This was originally behind the VPN, and it's not now. It still hinges on me needing to have uh, a username and password, of course, but I don't have to be on the network at all. And if I got that username and password by doing a targeted spear phishing campaign, specifically looking for that exchange administrator, then great. I did all of this remotely, and I never needed to be the other side of your VPN ever. This is the kind of stuff that pen testers love and you guys hate. Usernames and passwords though, wouldn't it be great if you only needed one username and password to get into lots of systems? Well, of course, you can, right? Um, people use single sign-on systems all the time. This is an example of uh, one login. Who uses one login? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> um, basically one login. So you only need to log in once and then you have access through sing web single sign-on to lots of things. And in the case of this compromised user, they had Box, they had Blue Jeans, they had various other interesting things, right? Even their benefits system. All I needed was one username and password to get to their life, their corporate life. Um, that's pretty, pretty stark. And like I said, it's a pen tester's dream, an attacker's dream. Okay, um, let's look at some other, other problems, other things that we see. All of your cloud data centers are belong to us. Um, basically, what's interesting about infrastructure as a service, and uh, what it's, it's around how you provision servers, and, how, and who you let stand up servers, and how often those standard builds, those images get updated. I've definitely seen a little bit of a dip in traditional infrastructure security. And I'm genuinely just talking about patches and configuration. Especially when you let your developers manage that process. I mean, they do the same job as a sysadmin, I guess. But this is what we had reason, recently. We had systems that were stood up in the cloud that were missing classic patches that, lent, that meant that I could get a system level compromise on them and then do all sorts of like traditional pen testing things to get a domain admin token and compromise the domain in the cloud. This all happened because it was missing patches. I would argue that people that have the traditional DMZ make sure that they don't have missing patches on those internet facing hosts. Because that was you know, something we had a problem with like 10, 15 years ago, everyone realizes patch your stuff that's internet facing. When it comes to cloud deployments, we're definitely seeing it creep back in, that the security of configuration and patching on those servers that you bring up, to up are not up to date 
and are not necessarily good enough. It can be a, a thing that really is the downfall. Okay, lastly, so this was brilliant. Um, shamelessly stolen doc, uh, diagram number two from Wikipedia. But we, it's actually linked to the previous one. So we went through this process of exploiting a machine that was unpatched and then traversing onto it. Like they had a, a shared local admin password as well, so you could get, like, pass the hash and get onto other servers. Again, classic pen testing 101. So we got onto other servers. We finally found a domain admin token for the domain in the cloud. And then we were able to compromise and take like, the domain SAM off the domain controller in the cloud. They had a full-blown infrastructure in the cloud, in short. But then what they also had was that the domain controllers in the cloud had a domain trust with the on-premises enterprise domain and an IPsec uh, trust relationship uh, access control, rather, that meant that if you were on the domain controller, you could also just RDP into the real domain controller in the enterprise network. So this is really like as bad as it gets. And when we talk to the enterprise uh, admins, they had nothing to do with setting the cloud deployment up. Can you imagine how annoyed they were? This was like a huge gaping hole into their company and all because of the way the cloud deployment was set up. It was a good day for us. Um, okay, uh, and then finally, as I said, uh, old-fashioned Citrix hack for the nostalgic pen testers. So lots of people um, that I talk to about this, you know, there's a number of them that always say, ah, yes, but uh, we don't have that. We haven't gone to the cloud, so we're in pretty good shape. And I say to them, do you have Citrix externally exposed? Yes. Do you have single factor authentication? Does it just use a username and password? Yes. Okay, well then pretty much the same kind of compromise is possible. If I can get a, an account that lets me log into the Citrix instance that you expose externally, I get this, right, probably. I get exposed um, published applications. Um, breaking out of a published application is like trivial to get to a real underlying desktop. In the case of this one, they actually gave you access to Internet Explorer and File, ex uh, File Explorer. Now, when I run those, where are those running? They're running on the server. They're not running on my machine. So you've given me Internet Explorer and File Explorer on a server in your network. It's pretty easy for me to then just go to other places. This is me browsing the sysvol of the domain controller on the internal network through this exposure. Really, really easy stuff. Um, I can then get a command prompt if I just use, uh, you know, File Explorer and just say, oh, no, I don't want to look at my home directory, thank you. I just want to run this thing called, uh, you know, Windows System32 CMD.exe. Where's that command prompt running? on the server, not on my machine. So I now have a command shell on a system that's internal inside the network. I include this one bec not because it's really anything to do with cloud security, but because it's the same kind of hack. If I can get a username and password and you've not protected the credentials properly, then I can get into a system that will, this time, give me genuine direct access to on-premises. OK. So um, I'll, I'll wrap up with some lessons learned. And I'm pretty sure most of you will be singing along with me with the last one. Authentication is really key. Um, before we get there, though, I'll, I'll go through some of the other points. The easiest entry points still deliver. They really do. This is pen testing 101. This is not sophisticated rootkit malware thingamabob. General control of assets is really important. How much control do you have of your systems that you've put into the cloud? Data security and confidentiality. Are you comfortable with your CEO and your, like everyone's email being up in the cloud um, away from your control? That's a good question. Uh, and then exposure to enterprise systems and traversal into the company network through those systems. If you rely solely on usernames and passwords to get into your cloud environment, you have a problem. You have a really big problem. I walked in on the end of the last talk, and on their lessons learned slide, the first point was multi-factor authentication, right? MFA? Yeah, absolutely. That is, makes it so much harder for me if you have that implemented. Um, a staggering number of companies don't have it implemented, like most of them. Easiest methods to get username and passwords are still the same ones they always were. Guess them, fish for them, or ask for them. Ask for them. You need to threat model the situation based on what happens if an attacker gets hold of the username and password for my exchange administrator. The answer shouldn't be, that they can act on behalf of the exchange administrator in the cloud. It should be, oh, but that doesn't get them anywhere because of X, Y, Z. If you don't have that, that bit and you have the first bit, you have a problem. How much control do you have? Yeah, you probably have quite a lot of assets, uh, control of assets in the cloud, but do you have enough? 
The trade-off is definitely important, I would say. It probably means that you don't put everything in the cloud. It, you need to prioritize. And I know that's really what firms are doing for cost, if for no other reason. Forensics and incident response is, is really, really key. Um, it can range from being easy to incredibly difficult. Um, firstly, your forensic examiners can carry out the forensic investigation in the cloud quite easily, right? So the process of acquisition for a virtual server in the cloud is actually easier. Uh, it's, I don't have to show up somewhere with a write blocker and take an actual uh, you know, disk copy of the server hard drive, you can create a snapshot and then let's say we're using, um, well it doesn't matter if we're using AWS or, or, or uh, Azure, you can then share that snapshot with me and then I can stand up an analysis server and connect to that snapshot. So you can actually achieve a lot of forensics virtually in the cloud. So I don't want to um, suggest that it's impossible, it's not. Um, where it comes harder is usually the, the logging side. How much logging and telemetry and visibility do you have of your systems up there? So that's really the one you want to look at in more detail. Um, oh, some examples. Yeah, this is an example of taking, obviously, a capture in Azure. If anyone uses Azure, they've probably done this many times. So you can take a capture of the drive, and you can provide it, and uh, we can work on it in the cloud. Your providers can work on it in the cloud. Um, same is obviously true in AWS. You guys have probably all done this, taking snapshots of the drive. If that's a system you think is infected, this is the quickest way to have somebody look at it. So data security, I would say, is something that should be on your mind. As I mentioned before, there are products that try to look at this. It is not an easy problem to solve, though, because you need your cloud service provider to be able to process the data in some way. But how much they are able to process it is really down to you. Um, so encrypting that data before it ends up in the cloud is, is pretty significant. Um, I would suggest on the last point here, this is what you have to consider. Uh, you should only put data in the cloud if you can afford to either lose it or have it exposed. Does that sound like your email? <laughs> Probably not. Um, so, yeah, something to consider for sure. Maybe it's not everybody's inbox. Maybe that's a better way to look at it. Who shouldn't be in the cloud? Okay, um, enterprise systems. Remember, it's your enterprise data. It used to be behind the VPN, which meant I had to get into the VPN first, or I had to walk onto your site and do some other way to get onto your internal network. Now I don't. That's the key thing. It's exposed in a way that it wasn't before. How many layers of authentication are there between your data and the rest of the world? If the answer is just a single username and password, I would suggest you've got a problem. Traversal paths. Now, I'm not going to suggest that everyone's going to fall foul of the same problem that we found, where you can get directly in, but you should definitely look at how are the servers uh, in the cloud connected to my enterprise servers? If the answer is not at all, great. If it's yes, they are, you need to look at how, who can do that, and for what reason. Okay, the big one, authentication and access control. Uh, authentication for cloud services is incredibly key. Most of you would have been thinking, yes, but if they had multi-factor authentication, he wouldn't be able to get in based on the username and password. That's ge genuinely true. However, most firms that we work with don't have that, believe it or not. And we work with lots of firms in lots of sectors. Um, they may have it as a minimal rollout, maybe only some users currently have it, or there's a pilot going on, but really the uptake is just not where it should be. Most firms, it's still a matter of, if I have username and passwords for users, and they use cloud services, I can get into those cloud services as those users. Lots of options exist, really, for multi-factor authentication. Google Authenticator and Duo, Duo Authenticator are examples. There are others. Um, with Google Authenticator, it's open source, so you can look at what they're doing, but there's no support, so you have to support it completely yourself. With Duo, it's closed source, so you don't really know exactly what's happening, um, but the support model's there. So in terms of being able to roll it out to your enterprise, maybe it makes sense, maybe it doesn't. Think. If an attacker gets credentials, it's the multi-factor part, it's the thing that's in their pocket, the thing that I don't have access to, that stops me being able to log in, stops them being able to log in. Interestingly, though, there's a lot of native support that's popping up in the platforms themselves that you can do on the cheap. I think uh, May 2014 was when Microsoft um, ultimately announced that everybody can use uh, multi-factor authentication in Exchange or Office 365 using text messages. Previously, it was only for administrators. I never see this turned on. I never see this turned on. And I would argue that the uh, overhead for turning it on is pretty minimal. Everyone's got a phone. So when you log in with your username and password and then text you the code and you put the code in. Um, the same thing is, is true with Dropbox. They all are starting to have this. Um, if your company's not making use of that, 
I would suggest they really need to look at it because the overhead is much lower than having to get something like Google Authenticator deployed. One last thing though, you've got to remember um, multi-factor authentication and two-factor authentication, whatever, um, it needs securing in its own right. And in most cases, it's about where you put the seed files for those tokens. Um, recent pen test, I got into a system through a vulnerability and then I had access to all of the Google Authenticator secret codes for all of the users. So it's not a silver bullet. You need to look at where do you put those artifacts. They shouldn't be on systems that are either on the domain, perhaps, or maybe that can be owned in a different way. This is where your vulnerability management program comes into play. If you're using multi-factor authentication, this part of it is key. Where are the seeds? Because if I have these seed files, I can effectively clone that token and get in using multi-factor authentication as that user. Wow, look at that. Exactly 45 minutes. What a pro. So uh, that's, that's what I had for you today. I really appreciate the time. Uh, if you have any questions, just let me know. So, well done. so folks, we have a microphone now for the questions. So if you would like to uh, ask questions to Kevin, I'm going to ask you to line up uh, behind the microphone. Uh, after that, we'll be having lunch, which is happening upstairs at Atrium. And we're coming back at 1 PM for the next talk. Thank you. You yes, mentioned sir. how um, the three basic attacks still work on almost all clients, which I've seen as well. And the first, with the passwords, you're addressing with a multi-factor. But for the other two, there were social engineering. How are your recommendations changing with the fact that it still continues to be an issue? Like, yeah. How has that evolved for you? Definitely. So I mean, a lot of people will tell you that it's all about education of your users. And yeah, that's good. <laughs> but it ultimately doesn't solve the problem in the way that you want it to. So for, the exa for example, it doesn't matter how much you educate your users not to give their passwords out via social engineering or not to click on links or run attachments in phishing emails, they will still do it. A number of them will still do it. So you, you need to look at designing um, technological solutions around protecting your organization from your users' actions. When it comes to um, phishing, that's often around things like uh, filtering what they can get to. So egress filtering and content filtering uh, for the systems they can get to. Because if C2 can't get out of your network, I can't take control of them. If they can't get to my stood up, weird version of your site because it wasn't on your whitelist, that will definitely help. So, and when it comes to the social engineering fact, I think it's about single points of failure, right? And it's about designing um, separation of duties such that your uh, privileged users that can do things on your network they have more than one account, perhaps. There's, there's account hygiene around that. Maybe they can give out, or they do give out one of their accounts, but they don't give out the real one, because they know that's the, the admin account. So I think that it's, it's not an easy answer, I'm afraid. But uh, designing systems and processes to protect your company from the user's actions is, I would say, more effective than training. Yes, sir. So besides the cost savings, a lot of people moved to the cloud because they believed um, the cloud service providers provide better security than you know, non-specialized providers, just general IT shops, security shops, and so forth. Um, do you believe that's the case after doing pen tests that the cloud service providers do provide better security than in-house? Yeah, I do actually. Um, uh, the reason I say that is because the way we break in is not really anything to do with the cloud service platform in most cases. It's to do with the options you've chosen to turn on. In this case, the use of multi-factor authentication in most cases. The fact that they are now supporting it natively in the, the platforms itself is a huge step forward. So I do think that um, most I would say pretty much all of the ways that we, we have these successes on pen tests are not to do with the cloud service platform itself. And, and the second question is, um, you mentioned one login, and there, there are a lot, of, you know, a lot of growth in that industry, the IDAS industry. Um, have you, uh, and a lot of these IDAS providers do provide multi-factor and so forth. Um, have you found anything specific? Obviously, if you get into that account, you get access to, you know, 20, 30, 50 systems. Have you found any kind of cracks in that particular space? In terms of the security of SSO products themselves? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, obviously I can't really mention any names, but certainly we have looked at SSL products and we have found vulnerabilities in them. Um, but obviously that's so, so critical to their business model that they fix it immediately and you know, ultimately it's kind of, I think, less of a problem than if you can just get into the SSO in the first place with a really simple password. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
I just thought it was uh, worth mentioning. So at my company, we've done a lot with SSL providers. We've used two of the, the larger ones. Um, one thing that they're a little bit bad at is actually looking for domains that are very uh, similar to their own. So in one login's example, you know, you might have the O be a zero, those types of replacements. Yeah. We've actually had a lot of luck phishing our users internally, uh, and all of our users have two-factor required. Uh, still no problems by simply doing an Nginx proxy and grabbing the <laughs> session IDs. It's a very simple trick, and a lot of the providers aren't currently um, doing enough to necessarily make sure that those sessions aren't jumping uh, yeah. from you know widely from one location to another. So that's that's somewhere a little improvement. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, and I should actually have said that we do successfully break into systems where multi-factor is in place using techniques like he just mentioned. Um, but you'll probably agree it's harder, significantly more difficult to pull off. So, uh, but yeah, very good point. Thank you. Wow, everyone was hungry, huh? Yes, sir. One more. Uh, we have a scenario where we use a single sign-on using one of the products which, uh, which uh, mm -hmm. allowed that to happen. Um, we are thinking about this. I mean, I want to see from your experience, have you seen anywhere where the external client who is trying to do a single sign-on, you know, if they are hacked, if their system is hacked, how do we protect ourselves? Uh, hmm. That's a good question. I mean, and this is an example of where you've offset part of your security control to a provider, right? You're using a third party single sign-on system. Um, in that instance, I assume that the attacker's actions and traffic are going to look genuine. They're going to look like just a regular yeah, because, authentication. Because set. they got the access to the user, right? Uh, exactly. Just like you mentioned health benefits, right? Someone can yeah. see health benefits. So if the, one, if the, on the IDP side, right, you call the IDP side, if the credentials are compromised, yeah. As a service provider, I'm in a problem, you know, because yeah. they can access someone else's data. I have, you, have you seen anything uh, to solve these kind of issues? Yeah, and unfortunately the answer is in how you monitor what's happening. It's usually, because it looks like the user, um, you have to look at um, anomaly detection, right, in the user's behavioral patterns. That's one thing that you would look at. The second, it's kind of like how the credit card companies do fraud analysis, right? They look for the ways in which you usually use the system, and then you look, they look for the ways in which you've actually started using the system, and if you're an attacker, you perhaps look different. Those are really the only kinds of things I've seen work, I'm afraid. Yes, sir. I know you said one more question, but it'll be quick, I think. What do you think about uh, password managers like LastPass? Uh, password managers are excellent. However, the way in which they're used are sub-excellent. So uh, password managers, either on the personal standpoint, like on the desktop, or enterprise password managers, all potentially suffer from the single, same single point of failure if you're using single sign-on or weak master keys or weak master passwords to get into them. They solve a great problem, though, don't they? If you have to, have, um, if you have to remember more than one password for your job or for your life, which we all do, then having this place uh, where you can get that data is important. Again, though, multi-factor authentication to the actual repo is the key. So I've done a lot of tests where they've had enterprise password managers, but that was on the domain, and it was single sign-on with your domain, your domain credentials. So once I compromise the domain and pull that person's hash out and pass it into IE and then go to the single sign-on, uh, sorry, to the enterprise password management web page, I'm logged into their repo with all of their passwords. If they had multi-factor authentication, I wouldn't have been able to do that quite so easily. The same is true, I mean, I run KeePass on my machine, but in order to get into my KeePass, you have to use a YubiKey. So offsetting that factor, I think, is important. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I was just wondering if you could comment uh, regarding any uh, difficulties you've had with including uh, these cloud services as part of scope and engagements, because uh, I, I perform penetration tests, and uh, that's uh, yep. that companies try and avoid uh, including things in tests. As uh, your, your clients do, or the or the cloud service provider? Uh, some clients we deal with, and right. we generally make them aware of the services. And if they don't want to test, that's sure. <laughs> yeah, so somebody usually asks me that question, and it's a good point. Um, and and so it goes in a few different ways. Sometimes people say to me, aren't you hacking the cloud service providers? And I say, well, no, I'm stealing credentials yeah. from, your, from our client and logging in. Um, also, uh, you know, most of the cloud service providers have pretty open agreements now about pen testing on their systems. They've been driven that way by their client base. Mm -hmm. um, from the perspective of talking to our, our clients, though, and when they say, 
we say to them, okay, what kind of test do you want us to do? Oh, we want you to model a real attacker pen test. Great, okay, let's just have a real quick like exchange of what you've got. Uh, do you use cloud services? Yes, we do. Okay, great. We assume that if we get credentials, we, we're gonna be logging into those. If they were to say no at that point, I would just have to ultimately say to them, why? You asked me to model what a real attacker would do. Mm -hmm. If they're adamant that there's a ring fence around it, customer's yep. always right, right? <laughs> but uh, you know, usually when you go through the attack scenarios with them and say why this is yep. important and show them what's being exposed, I find that they usually are okay with it. Most cases, though, I've not even had it come up. That's interesting that you've had it come up. Well, yeah, I think it's a communication issue in exactly what you're proposing. And okay. I also think there's an, an important distinction between, like what you said, credentials, harvesting credentials and getting in that way and pointing shooting a web vulnerability scanner at a, at a cloud provider. That's right. totally different. Yeah, you have to explain that difference because, yeah. yeah, some clients may assume that's what you're talking about. Yeah. And they'll say, well, this is a huge, like, why are we paying for that? It's a huge waste of time and money, and isn't that illegal? You know, and yeah. you have to say, well, actually, we're looking at something very different to that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, guys. You're excellent. Appreciate it.